The following interview was conducted with Thomas F. Pearson, Professor Emeritus of Hospitality and Tourism Management for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, November 5, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. The purpose is to discuss the history of the Hospitality and Tourism Management Department and your various roles in the department. Good afternoon, Professor Pearson. Let's start with, start with the history of the department, uh, somewhat unusual, and can you tell us how it came about? Uh, thank you, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about the department and how it fit into the history of Purdue. And the department history really starts 1973 um, out of an old institutional management uh, program in the School of Home Economics. Uh, this new department, which was now business and broad-based, uh, came uh, really as a contribution from other Big Ten universities. Joseph Seok was the first head who came with a strong industry background and we have to give credit to Norma Compton who was the dean uh, at that point who had a vision of what was possible with an expanded foods and business program within her school. It, it fit perfectly with a university that had a history and an appreciation of extension and industrial support so that was great and it fit perfectly because the university at that time was a little less compartmentalized than it became later. Um, the timing was was perfect if you like. Uh, society was becoming a little more affluent with new interests in food and travel. Uh, certainly people were becoming a little more demanding of improved products and services. The time patterns and families were beginning to change. A lot more two-income families uh, certainly were part of that and travel was starting to become more common as we completed the uh, interstate highway system across this country. Um, the foods industries were just beginning to professionalize and uh, we could build on that and shortly after that professionalization the hotels began to develop uh, thanks in many cases to uh, uh, the Marriott Corporation, who really focused on hotels starting in the early 80s, even though they had a strong foods background before that. The tourism industries followed the hotels. Government policy begins to develop quickly as tourism develops. And all of these industries and government units need people with specialized management skills, uh, starting in the beginning with people who understood commercial foods. Um, the pattern of our growth follows what happened to industrial management programs, uh, but we just followed by 10 to 15 years in this country. Okay. Um, the goal, if you like, of this new department was multifold and a little unusual. Um, we wanted to prepare the professionals that would lead this new, more sophisticated industry but then we also wanted to work directly with the industry to develop new and higher standards of service and product and to develop um, the operators to improve their knowledge and become a little more uh, profit oriented and uh, service oriented. Um, in addition to those goals, we started to work directly with the young professional associations. Many of the institutional foods groups uh, and hotel groups were just getting started in those days and they came to the university and wanted help. Uh, actual leadership through research follows a few years later. It was fun to watch the development, Catherine, about the department because it evolved and changed so quickly. That first 10 years was almost unbelievable. Um, the, the first challenge we found was to find faculty with academic qualifications and significant industry experience. There were no PhDs in the world in this field uh, by academic training. So in the, in the early years, we had to bring in people from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, and then we began to train our own uh, research qualified people. The second challenge, if you like, was to keep up with the student demand. Uh, enrollment grew very, very quickly. And uh, when the students came in, they quickly decided they wanted more specializations. So instead of just all starting with a commercial foods background, 
many of our students wanted to get into hotels and various parts of the travel industries. Um, the pattern, if you like, of our graduates um, stabilized fairly quickly. About 25% of our graduates went into foods-related businesses somewhere. Another 25% went into lodging somewhere. They might be finance specialists or marketing specialists, but they work for hotel companies. And then 50% went other places. Some went into healthcare, some went to work for airlines, some went to work for country clubs. Anywhere you can combine hospitality and food and service, our people ended up. And it was amazing to watch uh, the, the, the range of jobs expand. And a few years ago, we, we talked about over 150 different specializations that our graduates can, can move into. And, and of course, to keep up with those demands, new courses had to be developed very quickly. Uh, and changed very quickly as we moved because we still had a fairly small faculty. Um, the third challenge, if you like, in ch rapid change was to find some way to service uh, the demands uh, of the industry um, through the association and, and the professionalization of, of the industry and to, to live with the new regulatory things that were coming through various levels of government. Uh, we worked hard at that, and I'll come back to that in a little while. And then a fourth major challenge was to start providing direct help to individual professionals uh, as they started needing help with advanced skill development. Uh, eventually this leads us to um, all kinds of things, including the graduate program. Uh, looking back at it, that first 10 years encompassed a tremendously ambitious set of goals, much broader than you might find in a normal fledgling department. Mm -hmm. so. um, were there some unusual features to this new department? <laughs> Catherine, let me concentrate for a moment on the third and fourth challenges I outlined a little bit before. Um, Recall the third challenge was to meet the needs of this developing industry. Um, and, and one of the things we did was to address it by creating a very unique department. And some of the old timers around the university may, may remember that we, we developed what was called the Restaurant, Hotel, and Institutional Management Institute. It was a self-supporting office, was semi-autonomous, sponsored by the academic department, but it was housed in continuing education and conferences. Um, it was given great flexibility to design its own services, and many of our faculty and many people around the country became involved in providing it. Uh, I'd like to make special thanks here to uh, Frank Byrne, who was head of the conference division at that point, and Harley Griffith, both of whom um, encompassed a broad uh, concept of what the university could do and, and had a, an entrepreneurial bent and allowed us great freedom as we uh, began to develop this institute. And it, quickly it evolved into four primary activity areas. Um, the institute published training materials that were sold all over the world. It developed correspondence education for people who couldn't get to uh, common sites for training. And then it provided direct consulting services using Purdue staff and national set of people uh, to help with individual problems. And then last, it uh, provided support for developing professional associations. Uh, a lot of the associations were very unorganized at that point and uh, as they wanted to develop certification programs and testing systems and whatever, they had nowhere to go and they ended up coming to Purdue, especially uh, those related to food services. Yeah. And it was very successful and it operated for about 15 years. Um, that fourth um, challenge that I outlined was the developing programs to meet the advanced skills necessary for this new industry. Um, we, if you remember back, by the early 80s, we had pretty good restaurant chains. Hotel chains were now being developed 
but nobody really knew how to do it at that point. Uh, so education uh, sources were being asked to come up with some solutions. And then all companies and institutions needed purchasing specialists, corporate chefs, real estate specialists, quality control people, specialized finance people, specialized marketing people. Uh, it was amazing to see this range of things develop so quickly. Um, and it was much again like manufacturing had done 15 years before. Um, the unique thing for us was that the general management backgrounds were not sufficient. Companies wanted backgrounds in consumer-driven hospitality services. And, and so the demand again for our programs uh, began to develop. How did the graduate program fit into the Department of Development? Well, to meet all of these demands, if you like, the 1980, the department decided to build a graduate program. Remember now, the department's only seven years old, so to jump from that beginning to a full graduate program was quite a jump. Right. Um, but we did want to um, do three things, if you like. Uh, develop these specialists for the U.S. industries, and then to develop educators for universities worldwide who were beginning to get into tourism, uh, and then to assist in developing international tourism policymakers. Uh, so th this department became active in helping all kinds of governmental units at the regional and national levels uh, to, to build the kinds of systems that would attract tourists and provide professional services. Again, it was a very ambitious set of goals and for a young department, uh, it, was quite a, it was quite a thing. Uh, interestingly enough, because we were so in the right place at the right time, if you like, we were quickly recognized as a worldwide leader, especially for master's degrees. Um, we still did not have our own PhD, but we were offering the degree working in cooperation with other departments. Uh, it was fun because within a few years we were actually recognized internationally as one of the top three programs in the world for PhDs even without our own program. Um, but along with trying to develop these people in the early years, we, we worked hard to develop a full faculty of PhD level specialists. Uh, again, very unusual because there weren't any places mm -hmm. preparing them. So in some cases we actually prepared our own sent them off for a few years to get experience somewhere else and then rehired them, um, which say was a very unusual problem for Purdue and, and uh, we were fortunate the university understood that situation. Uh, we worked also with a lot of other institutions at that point to develop a full body of literature uh, on which you could build a full doctoral program. Uh, and when all of these pieces came together then we were granted our first uh, full standalone status for the PhD in the early 90s. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it all worked together, but it took a lot of work for a lot of people. Right, yeah. Did the, uh, any other worldwide developments influence the early department? Catherine, I'm glad you asked because this is really a significant thing. Uh, many things happened at that point um, to boost the, what was happening in this program. Um, remember, by the early 1980s, many countries are beginning t to develop tourism, and they're trying to build schools related to hospitality. Um, so these countries started sending students to Purdue. Uh, these were earmarked professionals, if you like. Um, they, were, they were already tapped to lead schools in their countries when they went home, and many were fully paid by their governments. So we were receiving the very best of people in these different countries to come here and work together to learn things and then to work with us. It, it provided a very exciting, stimulating academic environment. Uh, a good example of this, if you like, uh, remember in 1979, China opens to the world and it wanted to build tourism as a source of income. Uh, and of course, once they made that decision, every other country in Asia had to follow along. And so all of a sudden, we were training people that eventually would become the faculty for people in the Philippines and Taiwan and... and uh, uh, China as well. China as well. Right. Uh, 
So it would say it was it was really a fascinating time. Uh, and then of course, in 1989, Eastern Europe is released from the Soviet Union, um, and Purdue got graduate students from these countries along the same lines. Uh, so. Uh, Kind of going along with that, by the mid 80s, these countries recognized the need for research specialists, um, and many of these were sent to Purdue not necessarily for degree programs, but simply to work here for expended periods of time um, to develop, again, the body of literature that would uh, begin to lead these things. Um, there was another group that came to us, which was really exciting. Um, because companies in the U.S. were beginning to develop internal research capabilities. Uh, so if companies started sending people to Purdue to work with our specialists. Um, a good example that you and I have talked about in the past was IBM. Uh, our department, in partnership with IBM, developed the first industry-focused interactive learning laboratory. Um, it was exciting and it was, it was fun to work with. Uh, we, taught, we, taught new, we taught students new tools of computerized uh, management. Uh, we taught industry groups on new equipment that was coming out. Uh, we developed a, a early industry focused research. Uh, for example, uh, at Purdue we developed the first self check-in systems for hotels uh, using the computers and kiosks. Uh, and a, a lot of the food-related companies that had uh, production control and sales programs all beta tested uh, their systems at Purdue over that first seven or eight years of, of, of our being in business. Uh, it was a huge operation and it, and it allowed us to have tremendous impact across the universities. Um, other examples involved some of our uh, equipment testing people and uh, many of you remember seeing in Pizza Hut or some of the other companies these belt-driven pizza ovens. Uh, those were all developed at Purdue uh, starting in the early 80s. Uh, so uh, the impact of, of, of what was going on was exciting. Right. How did the uh, department maintain its focus during all of this? <laughs> well, with all of these <laughs> things going on, that's a challenge. Uh, I, I guess the hallmark to this program and the key to its success uh, simply involved a, a constant interaction with the hospitality industries and a focus to the needs of those industries, um, along with the concentration on the changing needs of the consumer. Um, once you combine those things, the rest of it followed pretty naturally. Uh, but we did want to maintain that contact, constant contact with the industries. And if, if you watch back, uh, this kind of focus then led us to develop our own career center um, because the companies, again, didn't want general management people. They wanted foods management or hotel people. Coming uh, out of your program. Coming out of our program. Uh, it also allowed us to stay closer to the industry representatives. And the companies that came also brought their presidents. So we had people of high levels coming into the classroom on a regular basis, and that was exciting. Um, that focus also led us to change our courses with some frequency to meet industry changes, um, and it led us to more carefully develop and change our specialized curricula um, to make sure we weren't wasting our time or student time. Um, if you look at the total then, uh, it helped us maintain our, our standing with the industry and even when there are recessionary periods or other difficult times, uh, the companies come to Purdue to recruit regardless. And in many cases, they simply stop going to other schools. Um, right. So it, it's, it's exciting uh, for us to watch that development. Right, and very rewarding at the same time. Very rewarding. Right, okay. Uh, this uh, uh, focus has also made it easy to develop student organizations uh, that have industry backing. It's easy to establish our industrial advisory board. Uh, it's easier for us to get our industry professionals into the classroom. Uh, it's easy to get some of our faculty assigned to um, industry projects, which is a, a big help over time. Um, and obviously it assists us in raising money uh, for the development, including the new building that's under construction today. 
And finally, uh, it's helped the department gain that number one status in the country, which we've maintained for a long time for our undergraduate programs. Purdue's very fortunate, if you like, in the sense that it's got two fully developed business schools and programs. Uh, I used to joke a lot with people in Craner saying that the only difference is that, that we have an informal agreement. They don't talk about Hyatt and I don't talk about Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. What do you see coming next for the hospitality industries? <laughs> that may be your hardest question of the bunch, Catherine. The, uh, it's a ch the big challenges. That it is. They're uh, still there. The hospitality industry is always under change. Um, and it, it, it responds directly to changes in consumer attitudes uh, and disposable incomes and government policies. So we're always in, in something that's developing. Uh, example of, uh, in the, if you like, in the, in the simpler times of the 60s, uh, we simply attempted to improve the basic food quality in restaurants. Uh, you know, in all honesty, the, the food quality in the old Howard Johnson's was not very good, and, and there certainly were a lot of opportunities to improve on that. Um, by the time you get to the 80s and 90s, we're starting to focus more on luxury and the, the specific customer's experience, and that was exciting. In the last few years, we've been watching massive changes in how companies are organized in finance. Uh, it, again, it requires very, very different skills, and, and we try to keep up with that. Uh, we've always tried to recognize those changes uh, as quickly as we could and uh, change both our course content and research focus um, so that we'll be ready right. to help if we can. All right. Okay. How did you get personally involved? Long story, Catherine. Okay. <laughs> kind of by accident and by luck, I there think. There you go. Combination of factors. Combination. Okay. I grew up in the construction industries. Uh, I was a carpenter, a salesperson, a construction coordinator. Uh, I've done most anything that's legal in the construction industries. And, and uh, I worked on a lot of commercial projects early in my life, uh, including foods operations, uh, uh, buildings, and whatever. Um, was very fortunate to have that background. It's been very helpful over the years. Uh, and I came to the university in 1967. I came to uh, work in the Division of Housing and uh, Food Services and uh, uh, became a, a general manager within that division in a, within a few years. And, and so um, over the next decade, if you like, uh, I, I had a, a good management background and uh, both food and, and uh, university administration. Um, I happened to get a PhD in a combination of administration and human resources. Um, I had the opportunity to work with several associations related to institutional foods uh, in, in that exciting period of time. Um, and I had the opportunity to teach auxiliary services management in the School of Education um, when it was graduate faculty then, uh, even though I was a full-time administrator, uh, I had always had this um, opportunity to have cross appointments within the university, um, and it continued for the next 40 years, basically. Um, in 1978, I began to teach in HTM, or what became HTM, and worked with the new um, Restaurant Hotel Institute. Uh, again, still while being a, an administrator, and I've always thanked Jack Smalley, who was vice president at that time, for uh, giving me that flexibility. Um, but by 1980, um, I was approached and asked to uh, change career paths and uh, was invited to develop the new HTM graduate program from virtually nothing and to become associate director of the Restaurant Hotel Institute. Um, and very fortunate to have many opportunities after that. But all of them, if you like, involve providing an interface between teaching, research, and direct industry support. Um, all involve uh, working with outstanding teams of people across this university and across industry segments. And uh, uh, much of the success I've enjoyed is, is really due to this wonderful combination of people that I was able to work with. Right as was common in 
among our early HTM professors, uh, our industry work led to changing research interests and to our teaching specializations. And in my case, my transition moved more to business analysis and finance uh, by the mid 80s and that's remained there for the, for the rest of my career. Um, I did serve as head of graduate programs, director of graduate programs until 2002. Uh, and, and it was fun to watch that program go from three students to uh, uh, a capped program of 50, uh, recognized as a world leader in this area. Um, we've continually been in the top three graduate programs in the world uh, since the mid 80s and that, that's been exciting to watch. Um, I did serve uh, in addition to my um, institute roles as the initial director of the IBM Computer Laboratory helped raise the money for that and, and work with the companies to come in and do their testing and the, the various functions we did there. Um, and for the Institute, it all tied together because I supervised all consulting activity and uh, oversaw a lot of the association uh, work with the individual groups. Um, in addition I have a question about the Institute. What happened when it didn't function? You mentioned earlier that it did it just fold into HTM or? The, the industry kind of caught up with it. Okay. And so the need wasn't there as much anymore and finally we decided it was, it was. Okay. But it ran, it ran for quite a while. About 15 years. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's, okay. It's Go exciting. Ahead. Yeah. Um, I've been kidded about the time involvement but in addition all those years, uh, once you're involved with all these different groups, you begin to get invited personally to provide industry advice. And uh, I did that for a number of years. Sure. And, and uh, the students um, uh, used to enjoy uh, asking about those projects because I did work in, on uh, individual industry problems in 37 states and worked in a number of countries, um, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and a lot of countries in Asia, uh, especially China and of course worked uh, in China for almost 20 years off and on on various projects. Right. You got a number of honors for the work. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of these recognitions? Well, remember, again, I was just in the right place at the right time, and most of these things came because Purdue was recognized as a world leader in so many areas. But uh, uh, I did receive honors in teaching and research and uh, uh, some special awards from different industry segments and government units. Uh, um, that was nice, but I, I was really honored to have students come to Purdue to work with me, and uh, uh, a little over 40 doctoral students came to Purdue to work with me, and, and, and those people are still close friends and uh, regarded as sons and daughters, and that's a, that's a special privilege. Also was honored to be appointed to many task forces and, and uh, advisory groups around the university, and including the uh, library advisory board for, for Dean Mullins, which was always a pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I came to the university, it was a smaller, less bureaucratic place, and there were lots of opportunities for many of us to cross over and, and to help each other, and that was fun. Um, In addition to that, um, in terms of industry honors, I was uh, honored to be chaired uh, or placed in leadership positions. And over the years, I have uh, been chairman of the board of directors for three corporations and uh, my national professional society and another small foundation. And, um, in addition to that, I put in about 10 years on board involvement with another nonprofit uh, related to food service and. Uh, uh, aging services, so um, it's been fun to to uh, have these opportunities. Right, and the benefit, and then after all this, and now, as of 2010, your retirement plans. The next stage. Next stage, uh, uh, Catherine. I do plan to continue to work with some nonprofit groups. Uh, years ago, I said for volunteering purposes, I would focus on things that involved aging and health care and food. It's amazing how many groups fall into those categories in some sure. fashion, and so I'll continue to do that for a while. But uh, more typically, I uh, really have some plans to enjoy my family and the process of slowing down. 
Yeah, that sounds good. I had a couple comments. Um, the career paths for many of your students now, what, uh, what are the current paths that they seem to be moving into? Has there been any change over time? Do some of them go into education and into teaching? Yes. Now with, with a graduate program and, and getting the PhD. Yeah, uh, um, really over the last 10 years, you, we've seen more and more students that uh, uh, get a degree in our field, go out, get two or three promotions, get themselves really well grounded in an industry segment, uh, and then uh, determine that uh, education and teaching might be something they would really enjoy and come back. Right. Um, and, and those are, of course, terrific students for us because they, they bring a lot to the classroom and they're ready to do research. They have a nice combination. Yeah, it's yeah. really outstanding. One of the other things in building your program, it, you mentioned this earlier, is getting qualified, getting uh, faculty with the, master, with the graduate degrees, and that must have been a really big challenge. It was. Plus and, uh, being the newest of the program itself. Yeah. And, and I'd like to give credit here because we did work uh, uh, with Cranach professors on uh, uh, some of our PhD committees. Uh, we mm -hmm. did a lot of students through the School of Education, um, mostly those two, but we did work with some students out of agriculture um, with some faculty there. And, and right. uh, uh, it, it was wonderful to get that kind of support from around the university. Right. What you mentioned about the new hall, I just wanted for the researchers in Stone Hall at the moment, there's two eating facilities which people, the staff and community, that will move to the new facility? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there will be a new John Purdue room Okay. that's uh, even bigger and better than uh, what people have experienced to, to this point. Um, uh, we'll have new complete institutional kitchens. And uh, so we'll be able to upgrade the training that we do there uh, with all of the latest kinds of equipment and, and uh, uh, the green kinds of concerns that are going on. And then we will have a uh, uh, coffee bar uh, thing, which is quite unique, and we'll have a, a traditional uh, short order uh, sure. right. facility, if you like, for people to get their lunches and, and come in during the day. Okay. Um, in closing, is there anything that I forgot to ask or anything that you would like to say in summary? I think well, I think we've covered a lot. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Pearson. I appreciate that.